Um, I'm going to go quickly so we can see a lot of things and then we'll have it recorded so all the steps will be there. But also because um, Paperspace, the service you use, I'm using, you have to get an account and put in a credit card number and all this because it costs money. And also, um, uh, you have to request access to their GPUs, which takes like a day, two days sometimes to get permission. So it's just, it'll be better, I think, this way. Uh, we'll just have to figure out a way for me to send the video to you. Like, I don't know how you want to distribute it. I can put it even as an unlisted video on YouTube or something like that. But Okay, um, so... Uh, okay, so basically what this will be is a um, like a quick tutorial on how to just do a few standard deep learning oriented, uh, use a few stand standard deep learning oriented repositories uh, that you can find online that are, that are kind of nice for doing um, like cool deep learning stuff. So I'm using a service called Paperspace, which is an online cloud computation service that provides uh, like GPU computers and, and also is like nicely set up for machine learning. You don't have to use Paperspace. You can use your own, um, uh, you can use your own um, machines if you have, if you have like, let's say a, a laptop made for gaming, that should be pretty good. Um, if you have also like, if you've used Amazon EC2 or Google Cloud Compute, that also works pretty well. Um, but basically, like, this will be a tutorial using Paperspace because it's the easiest thing to get started with. So, basically, once you sign up for an account, you would sign in. You have to put in your, your credit card number and whatever, all of that, of course. And it costs something like, I'll just tell you what the costs are. It's around, like, $5 a month, 5 US dollars a month for having a computer that's, like, not being used. So, whenever it's off. And then while you're using the computer, it, it varies in the hourly charge. The most basic computer costs something like a few pennies per hour, but that doesn't have a GPU, so it's not useful. It's not worth using. Your computer is better um, for that than, than, than theirs. But, um, but for the GPU computers, it's something like 40 or 60 cents per hour. Um, so it's not that much. Like for educational purposes, it's really cheap. Of course, it does add up if you want to use it for a lot of stuff like over time. And so at that point, it's kind of useful to pursue cloud computing resources. It's very typical for universities to have clusters uh, of like GPUs that they provide access to. So you may very well have some avenue, maybe ask someone at the computer science department um, if, you, if you might be able to use it because that's kind of the best thing you can do is have a machine available to you. So basically what you would do is you would create a new machine. And what I'm doing is I'm going to do it from the, starting from the basic templates that, that Paperspace has. I'm going to uh, I'll use their Europe cluster. You want to pick one that's closest. And then they have these, if you go to public templates, what will happen is if you're logging in for the first time, when you click on public templates, it will actually tell you you have to request access to get a GPU, and then you just have to write them. It's mostly made for spam prevention. It's really easy to get permission. You just write them an email, or not an email, you just write into the box, like I'm using this for deep learning and art research or whatever. You can even mention me if you want. They, they, I have a relationship with them. I don't know if that'll speed up access to it, but that's just like if, if, if for credibility, I suppose. Um, and basically, then you'll have access to these within a day or so. So I'm gonna start with, um, the ML in the box template. So ML in the box template is really useful because basically it's a fresh Ubuntu, Linux Ubuntu machine, which already has all of the major deep learning frameworks and CUDA set up. All of this, if you, if you know about it, is a little bit of a pain uh, to set up if you haven't done it before. Basically, um, to use GPUs, you need CUDA, Almost all of this is tied to NVIDIA stuff, so you have to have an NVIDIA card, first of all. So if you don't have an NVIDIA card, it like, it, it, it like basically TensorFlow doesn't work. Um, that might change in the future, but for now, that's, that's how it is right now. And you will also need to install CUDA Toolkit. CUDA Toolkit is this thing that provides GPU acceleration for, for code repositories that use it. And uh, all of the major deep learning frameworks are built on top of CUDA. Um, so this has that installed, TensorFlow installed, Torch, um, I think it has PyTorch, I'm not sure, um, and Cafe and some other things. 
So basically, we'll start with the Ubuntu ML in the box, 16.04. And we'll just do the, the basic one, 40 cents per hour, $6 a mo monthly storage. Um, you can choose a different storage amount if you want. We'll just use the basic one. And I'll call this um, UPF. Yeah. So then I will give it, so this is, so there's a few ways of interfacing with the machine. And I like to interface it with, you can use their built-in terminal that they have on the website. I actually like to interface with it uh, like separately. So I'm going to actually use a public IP. And this will let me access the machine from, from my own terminal or from, from the internet basically. Um, so I'm going to uh, select that. And then you select your credit card and then go ahead and create your paper space instance. And it will provision it. Now this takes usually like a couple of minutes uh, or maybe like one or two minutes. Um, in the meantime, I have to show you something, uh, which is that there's a little bit of an annoying, annoying thing about this instance, is that their torch, their torch installation on the ML in the box template is actually slightly broken. So I have a script online which fixes it, which you can find at gist.github.com slash Gene Kogan. Um, if you go to my last gist, so just that, so this, go to this place, oops, um, and then fix that sh, that's the top one right now. You basically just need to run this in a terminal. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, once this is done provisioning, we are going to launch the machine. And uh, what happens is when it provisions it, it will send you an email onto your registered account, giving you a temporary password for it. So I'm going to actually, uh, instead of pulling up my email on this recording, which I will share with you later, I will instead just look at on my phone. Um, this is taking a little bit longer than it usually does. So I hope, I think the, the provisioning sometimes takes a little while. Yeah, this takes usually like one or two minutes. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Anyway, once it's provisioned, you'll get an email that, that gives you a temporary password, which you can use to SSH into it. And it'll also have an IP address. Okay. So just hang tight. We can watch the little thing spin. <laughs> I'll pause this for now. Okay. This is plan B uh, because the paper space machine is not provisioning. Sometimes pa paper space is a startup, so sometimes they have issues with capacity. And if you get this, that it's trying to provision the machine forever and is not coming up, then um, that that's probably means that they're having a capacity issue. That's okay. Um, what we can do instead is use a little backup plan, um, which is to use... Uh, the, I have a machine in my lab in Germany, which I will SSH it into in the exact, well, I'll use it basically in the exact same way as we uh, ge generally look at the uh, paper space stuff. Um, the difference would be this. So here's what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to launch a terminal. And here I'm just going to have a new terminal. So first of all, uh, for those of you on Mac, this would, you would just do this with the terminal, uh, terminal app, Mac or Linux. For those of you on Windows, uh, Windows does not come with SSH or like bash scripting capabilities normally. So if you're on Windows, you have to get an application called Commander, uh, something like this. this. This lets you do, it's like a bash emulator. So just for those of you on Windows, please get this and then use this instead of in the same way that I'm using the terminal now. Otherwise, everything is the same. So what you would do if you were doing this in paper space is you would go to this machine if it had been provisioned and you see where it says public IP. This is the public IP of the, of the instance. And what you could do is you would copy that and you would go SSH dash I, uh, sorry, uh, what is it? SSH, you, uh, SSH paper space at that, at the IP address. And you would enter, and then it would ask you, like, are you sure you want to verify this ECDSA fingerprint or whatever? And you say yes, and then it will ask you for your password, and that password will be the one that you have in your email. Um, so they, they send you an email whenever the paper space machine has been created. Uh, and, or has it been created? Let's see. No, not yet. Okay, it's still provisioning. 
So this is how you would log in. Instead, I'm going to substitute this with my own machine, which happens to be located here. None of you will be able to get into it because you don't have the private key to it. So, um, so yeah, so don't actually try. <laughs> Um, what would happen is you would get into your machine and yeah, it would look like this. So this is my machine. Then what you would do is, uh, let's say you're in your home directory. So like, what, what do I have in here? I have a lot of stuff. So let me make a new, um, so let's do it from here. Um, I will now, what I will do is I will, this is the way that I like to interface with the machine. I will run, you will do this again exactly the same way from the paper space machine, except replace paper space with, with, with my machine here. Jupyter, you would go Jupyter lab dash dash no browser. This will create a Jupyter lab server, which lets you interact with the, the remote computer over a remote browser, right? So you'll see what, how I, this works. So I run this. Now, by the way, just note, like, just in case it isn't clear, I am running these commands from a terminal that's logged into my remote computer. So this terminal is no longer in my MacBook, but it's actually in this computer that's in, sitting in my lab in Germany. And then what you would do is you would create it. So this creates a new, see this goes, okay, I've created a new lab server and it's available at this location. Localhost, which means my computer, port 8889, and, and this token is for, for authentication. Now, I can't just put this into a browser because localhost does not mean my MacBook. It means my computer in Germany. So the way that we're going to connect to it is to create a tunnel. So what I'll do is I'll create a new terminal. And I'll go ssh-nl, and I create a port, which I'll do like 8160, just a random number, basically. Um, 8157 is my convention. I think I have 8157 occupied right now, so I'm, I'm not going to use that, but... Very typically, you'll see 8157. And then localhost. And then the port number that's given, 8889. Usually it starts at 8888, but I have that occupied right now. So this 8889. Uh, and then again, you would do paper space at your IP address, but instead, so right, you would, do, you would do this, right? Paper space at whatever, and then it would ask you for your password. But I'm just going to do my computer. Now what happens is nothing. And if nothing happens, if it just hangs up, nothing, there's no response, that means you did it correctly. And you can go to localhost 8160. And it will ask you to log in. There's a password or token. You can get that from, from here. So just copy that, put that in. And now what we have is a Jupyter, is a, is a sort of uh, a shell here that I can use to control my computer back in Germany. And we're using Jupyter Lab to interface with it. Now Jupyter Lab is super new. It's like, uh, it's only been out for two or three months. It's really new software, which is really cool. Uh, it's based on something earlier called Jupyter Notebooks, which has been around for a while. For those of you who are familiar with them, I see some nodding heads. Um, Jupyter Notebooks are basically these um, th this way of basically writing code in the browser and then having it ex execute on some, some remote computer, basically, and then sending you back the results. It has, um, you're allowed to package it with notes uh, written in markdown format. There's a lot of really nice features that makes it useful for educational purposes, especially. Um, this is super slow. Okay, no. Okay, and you'll get a screen that looks like this, right? So let me take you on a quick tour of Jupyter Lab for those of you who have never used it. You have this file explorer on the left side. We're in this folder that I created called UPF. That's the home folder. There's nothing in there right now, right? So, so that's why this is empty. And uh, what you can do is like you can create a, a new tab here like a, with the launcher and the launcher lets you create something. So for example, like I can create a terminal and now I have a terminal it's just like the terminal that we had before. This is my computer inside the UPF folder. Be like ls hello, pwd is um, what directory am I in? Um, this is all basic like uh, Linux shell commands to, to work with your computer. You can cd 
change directory, um, this, kind, this kind of stuff. Now, I'm not going to do a tutorial on how to use the terminal. I'm just going to introduce, term for those of you who have never used terminal, I'm going to introduce them as we use them. So that's all um, that we have time for. Uh, so now one thing I, I should note, I don't have to do this on my computer because my computer has a working instance of Torch. The paper space computer, however, needs you to run these lines into, um, into your terminal because basically like they're Lua rocks. Lua rocks is the thing that, that lets you load packages into Torch. Um, this is only necessary if you want to use Torch, which, are, which I'm going to do with the neural style right now. Uh, but otherwise, like you don't actually have to. Um, uh, this is you don't actually have to do this if you're just using TensorFlow. Um, so you would run these, and then we're going to clone the neural style library. So, ba but I'm not going to do that because I've already done that. So basically, these lines you would run into a terminal, let, and it'll take like it'll take like a good ten minutes or something. So you just go run those commands. You can copy and paste them all in, and then leave your computer. You know, take a walk. Come back in 10 minutes and you should have a fresh inst installation of Torch. Um, and then what we can do is I'm going to git clone neural style. I'm going to go to neural style in a second, but for, first thing I want to do is just actually clone the repository. Git clone lets you download a repository to your computer. That repository is neural style, which we, oops, here's neural style which is the, the style transfer, uh, is a style transfer repository. It's, a, it's probably the best one, in my opinion, and it's also the first one, or maybe the second one, depending on how you look at it. And it's cloning that, and then you also have to download the model in it. So you would CD into neural style and download these models. So I'm going to uh, CD neural style and we can download the model. sh models download model. Now this will take a little while. Um, so, oh, actually, let me. Yeah, that should be okay. I hope I'm not out of space in this computer. <laughs> um, okay, this the, the download takes a little while. So, so this will take like five minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to, or just maybe three minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to describe how what neural style does and how it works. Basically, neural style is a repository that lets you do style transfer, and I showed you style transfer before the break. Um, basically, it lets you input an image, um, you know, of uh, of whatever you want. You know, maybe this is Stanford or something like that, and then a style image, and then regenerate the output image in the style of the style image. Right? Basically, this kind of um, generic style transfer thing. And, and, and then um, and it has a bunch of configuration options that we can kind of go over right now, but I'll do the basic thing first. Um, the running the basic thing is actually really, really straightforward. So um, I'll, I can just actually um, let, let's, let's pick an image. Um, so let's let's. Let's uh, decide on two images. We want to do a content image and a style image. So let's get some let's get some ideas. What do you want to see? Like sometimes you take a picture of the class and then and then you know Van Gogh or something like that. But but let's get some some ideas. What's a good style image? What style would you guys want to recreate? Who's a famous painter from Barcelona? Yeah. Oh, maybe maybe that that might be a good. What what, what do you mean, like? You know, like if you do like your park well, so you come up with like a pattern. Park well. Uh, yeah. yeah. G U. G U. Oh. Uh, G -U. Oh, G U. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very obvious thing. The most. The most. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait. One person, help me spell. Well, well, one person, one person. <laughs> you, you'll do. Park. <laughs> Just that? Guel Park. What does this mean? Okay, right, 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 of course. So, so yeah, the... 
Yeah, it's more like mosaic. Like the leader, you see, like. The okay, I got you. Aha! Uh -huh. This is this is good. Yes, yes, I like this. Okay, so we'll do this, and now we need a content image as well. Now, who's a who's a famous? Now, okay, so now we have a, a style image. How about a content image? What's, what should be the content image? <laughs> a tourist? Right. To, what was that? Messi. Messi? <laughs> okay, yeah, alright, that's a good idea. Something, something very generically, like, okay, perfect. So I'm going to save this. Um, park well. Um, I'll put that in here, and and then messy. All right, what's the? <laughs> that's perfect. That's great. Okay. He's what? Our guy, yeah. How is he this year? Is he having a good year? It's all about Ronaldo these days, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Messy. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do is, yeah, exactly. I'm going to gonna go to my downloads. I'm going to just upload all this stuff. Messy part grill. So I'm just uploading it up to here. This will take a second. You can actually just drag and drop files. Now I also have to see if my GPU is occupied currently. Um, it currently is half occupied. That's okay. Uh, okay, so let's do the basic thing. I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to. So this is how neural style works. You will go th. Neural style, neural style, neural underscore style dot lua dash style image. So the style image is going to be part guel, a JPEG. Content image is going to be messy. And then, um, and then also we want to do uh, the output image. So we'll we'll call it. This is just a name now, so we'll say Messi Gel. Does that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> .png. And uh, there's a few other optional ones. Um, and I'm actually going to select this. I'm going to select CUDNN backend. Now, you won't be able to do this initially in paper space because you have to install CUDNN, which I already have on my computer. CUDNN helps you minimize memory usage because as you can see, I'm actually using my memory for something else right now. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to optimize this for memory right now. And uh, let's do it. You, the the backend option is, is optional. Backend parameter is optional. So it loads the model and then hopefully it doesn't run out of memory. And it's going to generate a 512 pixel wide image and it's going to go pretty quickly you see it goes in iterations yeah what was cudnn cudnn is a um, it's basically another piece of software made by um, made by an nvidia that works nicely with cuda and it just sort of um, it's like a very exactly yeah it, it's like very efficient neural network implementations in in cuda um, which a lot of stuff uses but it's it's sort of usually optional um, but but oftentimes it's it's nice to have. Uh, one thing I'm curious about is how much memory it actually is saving us right now. So, what? Oh, yeah, it uses very little memory. In fact, so it's actually like we might be able to make it a little bigger. So let's see here. Um, this is measuring. So basically, the way style transfer works in iterations. Remember, I showed you actually 
the Mona Lisa being restyled in Van Gogh style. So when it first starts, after just a hundred iterations, it looks like this. This is messy in the mosaic style after a hundred iterations. So you don't see very much, right? It takes a little while. It starts with an image that's kind of gray with like random flickers of noise, and then it gradually uh, changes. So we're actually going to go ahead and wait this out. Let's actually, well, I want to make it maybe bigger. Uh, well, let, let's see how it looks. Okay, after 100 iterations, it's this. After 200, it's this. So you see it's beginning to, right, 300. Yeah. Um, so you see the idea, but let's, let's actually stop this and make it bigger because I think we can get away with making it bigger. So basically, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to interrupt this and let's make sure it's not... I have to... Sorry? Images of patterns that you do carefully and then suddenly appears as the model. Do you remember? Oh, um, I don't remember what they're called. I know what you're talking about, but I, I don't know what they're called. Maybe it's possible to generate some of them also with the same. Models. Possibly. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to do this again. But it, now I'm going to actually change the size parameter. So there's an image size parameter. And, in, and it, it's 512 pixels by default. Let's make it 1024. And this will make it use up a lot more memory. But I think I should have enough left over so that it actually works. So let's see. If you make it too big, it'll complain at you that it ran, runs out of memory. But it looks like we're fine. I can even check right here if I run. Is defined by default the height? Sorry? The height is defined by default. It doesn't have a high by default. It just has a. It just says 512 pixels is your is your is your default size. You can try to make it as big as you want, um, but but you will be limited. It's a square or it's a format. Oh, it, it just keeps the aspect ratio of the content image. So it's 512 pixels on the longest side. So whichever if it's taller than, than it's the height. Um, yeah. So if you make it bigger, it takes up more memory, but also it uh, goes slower. However, it's bigger, so that's kind of nice. So let's see how big it gets. Um, while it's cooking, uh, because it'll take like five minutes or so, so we can come back to it and see. While it's generating, I also want to show you uh, pix to pix. Yeah? going to rewrite the message. Yeah, it's just going to overwrite them. Yeah. Unless you give it a different image. Oh, look at that. My paper space instance is ready. So, um, how about. Yeah, so let me. Okay, how about this? I'll take you. Because my paper space instance has just been allocated finally. Um, yeah, see? Usually it doesn't take so long, but, but okay, now it's ready. I'll take you through the process of doing this on paper space. So, you would go into here. It says it's ready, and I'll make a new terminal. Let's actually just run a new terminal altogether. And basically, you would go, you would do, you would just repeat this process. You'll go ssh uh, paper space at public IP. You can copy it. Then I'll go. Uh, oh. If you do this enough times, you'll get this problem sometimes uh, where it goes. Host key verification failed. That's just, it's a simple thing. Uh, there's a way around this. You do ssh key gen dash r and then the address and then it'll kill it. Okay, now I'll try it again. Yes. And then it asks me for the password and basically you have the password in your email. You'll receive this email that says what the password is and you can just type that in. I'll be like q q T, Z, um, I guess I don't need to say the password out loud, but um, it's just temporary. You can actually change it as well. F just a random character string. Once you're in, 
You can actually change the password using sudo passwd paper space. And then you can be like, okay, new password. I'll say the password is UPF. UPF. Okay, password updated. So now I'm inside a paper space. I can launch Jupyter Lab server. This is exactly the same thing that I did with my computer. There it is. And I'll start a new terminal. I'll go dash NL8157, localhost. And here it's 8888. There it is. So 8888. Uh, paper space at URL. Asks me for the password again. I've changed the password to UPF. So let's do that. Now it's working. I can create, I can go to an, a new. Uh, yeah, and now this is here, so basically I need a token, grab it from here, just a um, security measure, and now we're inside of a paper space machine. So this is what you would do to fix, to fix basically like um, I showed you before how you need to do this. You could just copy all of this and uh, just paste it into the terminal and let it run. It'll take like 10 minutes or something to install all that stuff and then it'll be fixed. Um, so 8157, go. It won't actually type them all in, but it, it, it entered them all in one by one. So now this is, this is basically installing a bunch of Torch libraries um, that, that aren't already on the computer. So basically, while it's doing that, I can also run, I can actually download those models as well. So I can be like, git clone neural style and download the model. So, oops, so cd neural style, download the model. So this is doing this in two terminals at the same time. We can come back to this later when it's done. Um, so back to my paper space. Uh, we're 400 iterations through. Let's let it be a surprise. Uh, I kind of just like, we'll see what the 1024 pixel messy well it looks like um, in a few moments. <laughs> and um, OK, so now what I want to do is show you pix to fix uh, now here's the thing about PixPix, we won't actually get a chance to train it because it takes too long. To train PixPix, it takes like at least a couple hours, and, but, at, but really better is to train it for like a day and then come back. Um, so, but I'll take you through the process of beginning to train it, uh, and then we can, you know, then I, and then I'll kind of try to bring it back into context by noting some of those projects that we looked at earlier, because those are quite nice, of course, so you can, you can certainly, um, like get some ideas from projects that other people have done. Um, I want to use papers, uh, PixPix and uh, maybe if we have time we'll look at charrnn, but I think maybe Paperspace will kind of take us through. So um, I'm back in my uh, local Paperspace account, or let, let's, or sorry, my local, my computer in Germany. Let's see if we actually want to use this. No, it's still downloading, right? Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll just create a new terminal while, while um, the messy well is running. Um, and I'm going to find pix to pix Now, I like using pix to pix TensorFlow, which is a TensorFlow version of it. So you just clone this, grab the URL, go back to here. Just going to put that there. So git clone so I'll clone pix, uh, pix, pix TensorFlow. So that's what that looks like. We can actually see it in the file explorer now, pix, pix TensorFlow. Now here's the idea with pix, pix TensorFlow. So you basically you need a data set. And the one that they like to use is the facades data set um, as an example. So I'm actually going to download that. So all you have to do is actually copy and paste this to get to do the basic example. Um, 
So Python tools download data set. Um, let's say we'll download facades and then let's take a look at inside of it. Uh, downloading facades should take like a second. It's really small. Okay. So here's facades. Now here's the facades data set. This is what it looks like. There's three folders inside, train, val, and test, and they're all the same. They have images that look like this, um, roughly. So here's an image inside of facades. It's a 512 pixel by 256 pixel image, which is split into two halves. A, um, you know, here it's an architectural facade, like a building front, and, um, and a label map. Um, and and what you see is that like the, the windows correspond to like light blue, the window sills are kind of yellow, maybe the door is this baby blue, um, and maybe that's, yeah, let's look at another example. They're all basically of this type. And the idea is that we want to train picks to picks to be able to convert one into the other, right? And the, again, like you, you have to format your data set in this, exactly this way. So you have these images, uh, they're 512 pixels by 256 pixels. PixPix -Pix TensorFlow is, is actually hard-coded to be 512 by two, uh, two, so the images are 256 by 256. I think maybe the Torch version can let you do it at 512 by 512. Um, otherwise, like, if you want to change the size, you have to sort of fidget with the architecture, and that can be really complicated. So I would just... Do it, use it this way for now. It's a little limiting, but, but it basically works um, out of the box if you do. And the way that the images are related to each other, that's up to you, right? So here you have these label maps where a particular color corresponds to a particular semantic feature. Um, but, uh, but of course, that, you know, that, that could take on a lot of other kinds of formats, right? So you can do face tracker, right? Or you can do skeletons. Or, um, you know, there's a lot of things you can do, right? You can kind of use your imagination. Um, I showed you a bunch of examples earlier, street view scenes, depth maps. Um, there's, you know, tons of, tons of possibilities, right? And, uh, and then to actually go ahead and train it, you have this data set, right? Here's the images. And basically you select one folder for training, right? You'd put all of your images in that you want to train on, and they're, they're combined into these combined images. And then you would go into pix to pix TensorFlow. And I'm basically actually just reading from the documentation. This is exact, exactly how you use it. You go pix to pix to train. You would do the following. Mode train. Then there's a few arguments. Output there is where to save the model. Because when you're training, you're building a neural network model. So this is the folder to put the model in. So you just give it a name that you'll remember. Then max epochs is the number of times to train on the data set. So basically it will cycle through the data set, in this case, 200 times. So the more, effectively the better, right? The more you train, the more times you give it the same data, it will get better. However, um, training more is not always better, or I mean, it's, it's usually not worse, but um, but, but there's a point at which it may, may stop learning, in which case you're just wasting GPU cycles if you keep on training it. You can monitor it as it goes and then interrupt it early if you want to. You can also go for 50 epochs and then, and then pause it and then resume later. Those are all things you can do. Um, but basically this is the number of training epochs. You can leave it at default if you wish. And then the input there is the directory which holds the images that you're going to be training on. So that's going to be that facade slash train, right? And which direction, uh, this is kind of an awkward naming convention. Left to right is A to B. Right to left is B to A, right? So we have these, um, like if you want to do label map to facade, it'll be B to A, right? Right to left. So basically you'd go Python, pix to pix dot pi, dash dash mode, train input there is our folder of images that's facades slash train and then output there is going to be where to put the checkpoint so let's put that onto um, 
Uh, let's let's put that onto. Oh, you know what? I, I, I wonder if I have enough memory on this right now. <laughs> this might run out of memory, but let's see. Um, I'll put there. Uh, let's say facades model. And um, uh, what was it? Max epochs, right? Max epochs 200. Let's say like max epochs 10 for the sake of argument. And um, and I think that's all, right? Yeah. So now before I run this, let's make sure that the style transfer is done. So it has some GPU. So let's see if this actually. I hope it doesn't run out of memory. Let's see if this will work. So it starts to tell you all of the, um, oh, this is bad news. This may not, oh no, it looks like it came through. Yeah. So now this will train for 10 epochs. Um, oh, I did A to B, right? not, not B to A. It doesn't matter because <laughs> it's not going to look that good anyway. OK, so we're doing the facade to the label map. What, what, one. Yeah. Yeah, this is a G, uh, this is a Titan X, the old one. This is from two years ago, I think. So anyway, while it's training, um, basically you can see that it takes, yeah, it's, it's estimating that it'll take roughly 14 minutes. Um, so we can kind of like let it go. It's not going to be particularly impressive when it's done, but just for demonstration purposes, you know, because really you want to train it for a day, like ideally. Um, you know, facades takes one to eight hours, it says, on GPU. Um, but, but a bigger data set could take longer. It scales with the number of, of, uh, of items you have. So, and facades is actually pretty small. Um, actually, well, it's not that small, but, but it's, it, it's smaller than some of the other data sets. Um, so, it goes for a really, so it goes for a while. And uh, ideally, you want to train it for a while to get the best results possible. Of course, you only have to do it once. Then you have a model that works. Um, so, so yeah. Anyway, while this is training, uh, the basic model, we'll test it when it's done. In the meantime, let's look at our, our, our messy Guel. Everyone forgot about that, right? Well, it's, it's ready. So let's go open it up. Sorry? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Let's, uh, I'm just going to download it. You can download it directly this way. Hello. My computer's kind of slow right now because I'm recording. But it's beautiful. It's very heroic. Um, yeah. It's it's it, it looks realistic, but it's actually synthesized from random noise. So it starts as random noise and then it evolves. So the the content actually sprouted up. Um, one thing we could do, uh, we could do the following. Let's do this again, except we'll make the content weight zero. So basically, there will be no messy. It will just be um, a texture synthesis. Oh, we can't because the GPU is occupied. <laughs> Let's do it. We'll we'll do it in paper space. We'll do it in paper space. Yeah. The, uh, does it work in? I'm sorry. I, Uh, you can't. Yeah, it it doesn't really let you let you specify like that. Yeah, 
Um, in, in the meantime, let's do this actually because I bet you the paper space is ready. Yeah, yes, excellent. Um, so now let's do this in paper space. So now I'm back in paper space instance and I'm actually going to, I've already got neural style in here. So let's actually, um, let's do a texture synthesis. My computer is going really slow right now. Or actually the paper space instance is actually just hard to log into. Ah, okay. So let's let's upload park well to here. Okay. Now we're gonna do this TH neural style dot lua style image park Park well. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make the content weight zero, which means that the input image is no longer taken into consideration. Now you still need to give it a, oh, an input image because um, because it needs to it just uses the dimensions of the input image. It's just part of the arguments and won't let you proceed. So we'll just use the park well also as the inter, as the content image as well. Um, so but it won't actually matter. It just it will copy its size. Is the uh, start from zero or it's noise? Uh, it'll it'll start at noise. It, it so it starts at like gray with minor changes, like random perturbations. Like noise? Uh, not parallel noise, yeah. just random noise. Ra uh, I think like random normally noise, but yeah. Park well, and then image size. Let's make that ten twenty four also. And then we'll say the content weight is zero. And um, the output image is going to be, uh, uh, we'll just say park guel text for texture, PNG. OK, this should work, hopefully. So this loads the network. And uh, hopefully we have, oh, okay. So if you get this issue, out of memory, using too much memory. So if you try to install CUDNN, I don't think I have CUDNN, but you should be able to do this if you have CUDNN. No, it doesn't have it. Um, so the paper system doesn't have it. I don't have enough time to go through the installation of CUDNN, so just that's something you can find instructions on online. But I'll just do it smaller instead. So we'll say instead of 1024, I think, I think 900 should work. This is on the paper space computer. And the one I'm using is on my computer and I have CUDNN which optimizes the memory usage. 900, I think looks like it's gonna work. So 900, it's not so bad. Um, so this is going to make a texture synthesis of Park Well. So let's see how that looks. And it's gonna take like five, 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, we can kind of let that be. In the meantime, let's see how we're doing back on our paper space front. So there's, yeah, epoch 10, six minutes remaining. In the meantime, let me do this. So we have basically five minutes to train on um, PixPix TensorFlow. And around five minutes, I think it'll take to generate that, that style transfer. So in the, in the meantime, what I'll do is I'm going to maybe do a quick review of like things, other repositories online that you may wish to try out. Uh, we won't have time to do a tutorial of them, uh, but they're all kind of like self-explanatory, relatively self-explanatory. Um, so there are things that once you kind of know how to use a command line, you can more or less you know, teach yourself them how to use. They're all reasonably straightforward, um, and they they're good tools for for uh, for this kind of stuff. Um, let's see which ones. How about Char RNN TensorFlow? So I think uh, we talked about yeah we we looked at the LSTMs yesterday. So how do you train your own LSTM, right? Um, so there's a there's a TensorFlow implementation of Char RNN. which is your character level RNN. It's a, 
recurrent neural network, which will generate sequences of characters. So um, basically, you would, you know, like you, uh, well, here, let, let, me, let me actually go ahead and clone it. So at least we have it. I'll put it in the paper space instance. So let's, yeah. Real-time feedback? Yeah, if you have a model like uh, source to detection, uh, we work giving information uh, about how the JSO is performed. About how what's performed? Uh, JSO or ground or whatever that you is in time domain. I'm not sure I understand your question. About char RNN? How does this relate to char RNN? No, or this is a different question. The LSTM. The LSTM. What about it? If I can use it for uh, recognition. Oh, oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so, in principle, like you can you you can do classification with LSTMs. You know, it's like a sequence as an input, and then the output is a is a classification. So, so yes, but the shortest. Uh, it it will be better than the Markov model for things that have more long term dependencies. LSTMs are just, you know, if you have a very simple statistical relationship, then, then probably Markov models are fine and cheap. If you have uh, something that is more complex and longer term, then, then an LSTM, um, or maybe just a vanilla recurrent neural network, might outperform it. Yeah. There's also a, another thing you can do called dynamic time warping, which is something that kind of tries to measure for the gesture over time. One problem with gesture, gestural stuff is you never, like is, is a problem of engineering, because sometimes you don't know uh, like where, when does the gesture begin and end. So that, that's kind of, a, that's something that dynamic time warping solves nicely because it's always constantly giving you the current probability that the last few whatever are the gesture that you're looking for. Um, whereas if you are using an LSTM, you need to decide what the beginning sequence is and what the end sequence is. Um, you can also, like, you, another thing you can do with the LSTM is you can continuously, like, every sequence, like, just continuously try every sequence. That's also something you can do that gets around that. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the, the devil's in the details, as they say. You know, it's like kind of depends on what your application is, what your performance demands are, and so on. So, yeah. Um, so let's clone tensor, char and TensorFlow, and I'll go into char and TensorFlow. And basically, like you see, that it comes with a two scripts that are important to us: train and sample. And train will train a char and model, and sample will sample from it. And basically, it comes with a sample data set inside the data folder called Tiny Shakespeare, which is the completed works of William Shakespeare. So you have this big text file that has like all of Shakespeare in it. It's like it's like five megabytes big. So if you want to create your own data set, you would just you would just upload it. You know, you create a folder and it has to have a text file called input.txt. Right? And then you would go into char and TensorFlow and you would run the following script. Python train.py. And then it's like, I think says here, train that pi. Well, we can, we can look at that help. We could be like, okay, so if you want to get the options, you would do help. This tells you all the options. The main one is data there. So this is, what is the folder that has the text file called input.txt that you're looking for? So you basically go like python train dot, python train dot pi, data there, oh, it's invisible. And then, you know, you'd be like data slash tiny Shakespeare, right? If that's what you want to use. And then also, then that's really all you need. Then, then also save there is where is it going to put the model. And by default, it'll put it in this model called save. So if you want to have multiple models, give it a name. Um, and then there's all these optional parameters, which once you know a little bit more about how to use LSTMs, you might be able to configure. 
Generally speaking, like the important ones are things like RNN size, num layers, seek length, batch size. Um, those will affect the size and complexity of the neural network. And generally speaking, the bigger the neural network in terms of the number of layers and the number of neurons, the more complex of a model it can form, which is gen generally a good thing. Although then you are sometimes combating issues of overfitting. If the model is overly complex, there's the opportunity that it could memorize your data set. And it could, you know, you're like, oh, this sounds exactly like Shakespeare. And that's because it exactly is Shakespeare. And so the idea with char is you want it to, or with recurrent neural networks in general, is that you want them to generalize and, and create novel sequences. So there's all these, uh, there are regularization parameters, which I'm not sure if there are any here. Uh, grad flip. Not sure if this has any regularization. Uh, well, another thing is like the sequence length is the, the length of the sequence that it's learning from. Um, these are all sort of more expert domain stuff. You can use the defaults for now, and, and generally speaking, it should work fine. Uh, you want a text file which is at least a megabyte, but proper at least five meg, even five megabytes is better. Uh, I think the Bible, uh, Gen Book of Genesis, is is is. I think like three megabytes. Um, is that is that a weird way to look at it? The book of Genesis is three megabytes. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. What happened if you train your EDM pieces? You're going to discover new pieces. It could be, yeah. You'll discover all sorts of things about biology that you didn't know before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody has tried? Maybe. Probably. This has been done so many times now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's still a favorite thing though. Like it, it never stops being funny, I think, somehow. Personally. Um and a lot of people haven't discovered it yet, so it's still kind of this you know, novel thing. Um, I've trained it on my own email. So, like, if you export your email, you can, you know, because you, you've definitely written a few megabytes worth of email. Um, so, and, and a funny thing is, okay, so a lot of your, probably all of your bilingual, and if you write half of your emails in, in Spanish and half your, your emails in Catalan and half your emails in English, it'll kind of code switch. It'll, like, one sentence in English, one sentence in Spanish. You know, maybe one sentence in, in, in Catalan. But we usually see the Catalan Spanish mixture because they're they're similar enough that it might just like do it in the same sentence, like combine Catalan and Spanish words together. I think. But I, of course you do that already, right? Uh, to some degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a funny thing, yeah. Do chat logs. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so if there's anyone who you talk to a lot. Um, so those are all things you could do. Um, and it'll be pretty funny, right? Like, <laughs> And let's we'll just see how this is doing. So this is done. So let's train it for a little bit. Like, I'll train it. Um, we'll train Tiny Shakespeare. And I don't know. It's not going to get very good because we have only a few minutes left, but let's let it go for a few minutes and, and then come back to it and I'll show you how to sample. Um, in the meantime, let's look at our, see we keep on putting something down and then see, see how our texture looks. Park well text. So I'm going to download that. Uh, so this is our park well text. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah. We do a little bit of a. Uh... Sorry. We can, yeah, we can, we can uh, make some adjustments. How's that? There you go. Go day would be would be proud. <laughs> so um, let me because we have just a few minutes left. Let me quickly run back to this Jupiter Lab instance. We finished training picks to picks. Finished training like for for like ten minutes. So it's gonna be, but it's funny because it learns the most in the beginning. So like ten minutes of training is probably like like twenty percent of the accuracy. 
and then you know one hour is like 50 percent of the accuracy and then five hours is 70 percent of the you know it's kind of this logarithmic curve so this will actually like probably make sense at least on some level anyway we can go back to fix fix tensorflow we can see this is the train to test remember that when just to remind because we did this a while ago now remember that we created this output there which was uh, the, the where the model is located and uh, there's an input there which is the directory of images so for testing now we say the out the checkpoint is the same as the model you know that's where the model is so that's the output there from training so that's checkpoint and then output there is going to be the folder that puts in the images that we put the images into and input there is the images that we actually test on and conveniently the pixel -pix the facades data set comes with three folders train val and test so we'll just use the testing folder um, which looks exactly the same as the training folder, just has different samples. So I can go Python, um, pix to pixpy dash dash mode, test, dash dash input there, facades, test, oops, facades, test. And then checkpoint is going to be, remember we made this folder facades model. So facades model. And then output there is going to be We'll just call it facades test. So uh, run this, and then it will load the model and checkpoint, take all of the images inside of facades test, and it will generate images from them. And it will also uh, conveniently make an HTML page that we can download, that we can browse it on. However, since we're inside the Jupyter browser, Jupyter Lab, we can't actually look at the HTML file unless we download it. So we'll just look at the the images instead. Basically we go to facades test. If you download the whole thing and then click on index HTML, it'll load it in your browser and you'll have you'll be able to look at all the the targets and stuff. So let's look at the images. So basically, okay, so like for example, 102 inputs. So this is the input. This is the original target. So this is the input. We did A to B, so we did uh, the texture to the label map. So texture to label map. And this is the output. Not bad. For, for so little training time, it's like kind of reasonable. So if you train it for longer, it'll be better. And if you train it in reverse, we'll, we'll, you'd have it the other way around. Um, so yeah, that's the basic picks to picks architecture. So we covered pix pix um, we covered style transfer and texture synthesis, and we're training char RNN, but, but of course we don't have very much time, so let's just, let's just try it. Like, we haven't trained it for very long, so it's not going to make any sense at all. Well, you can actually estimate how long this will take. So, seven, so there's 22,000 iterations going by roughly uh, 0.03 seconds. So it'll take like, it'll actually only take like a few, um, like a 10 minutes. No, there's just minutes. Because this is actually, the default settings are really low. So in any case, like if you just do this, stop it. And then you go python sample.py. It's going to look like garbage. Because um, it hasn't trained for very long. First of all, it loads the model and then, okay. He's with in our stew foolish gold first met yet the day injured in Bishland, yeah. In their lion that it's actually you can see words in there, so that's that for, for like a few minutes of training, that's pretty impressive. Okay, so we're out of time. I want to do one last thing, which is show you make always make sure if you're running paper space, because you will be charged per the hour uh, for that computer. You want to stop the machine so that it doesn't charge you for hours that you're not using it. There's also an option to have it uh, stop automatically if you idle after some amount of hours, so that's, that's a useful thing if you're forgetful. Um, otherwise, you can go into the paper space machine by clicking the gear icon and clicking shut down if you want to keep it. And if you want to get rid of the computer so it doesn't charge you per month either, you can deactivate, and I'm going to deactivate. So, so without further ado, this computer is gone. Um, it's prorated, I think, so $5 for a full month. Yeah. 
and then you know if it's if you use it for just an hour, uh, it it should not charge you that much. I'm, I'm pretty sure they prorated it, but you might need to check uh, on their terms. Um, so yeah, so so that's all. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh huh. I'm glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So it depends on which at which level. So if you like, of course, this is a short workshop. So we we did that on purpose. I have a uh, a website called ml4a. Git. Dot github. Dot io. Which um, and there's a section called guides, and in particular the Python guides will have tutorials using a programming language called, or not a, a, a library called Keras, which is built on top of TensorFlow, and these are basically tutorials that try to answer questions like that. Um, now these are still at a relatively high level compared to what a research scientist might demand, and for them, you know, you might want to take a course like a MOOC, you know, and there's a bunch of machine learning courses. There's a course called uh, by Fast.ai, which is really nice. Um, Fast.ai, basically like course. You can look up the course. They have a machine learning course, um, which is really good. Um, and that's re that's actually using PyTorch, which we haven't looked at, but but that's that's what they use. Is uh, yeah, kind of. It's. It's probably a little, it's, it's, it's probably somewhere, the level of abstraction is probably somewhere between TensorFlow and Keras. So it's a little bit friendlier than, tens, than raw TensorFlow, um, but it's, it's probably a little bit more customizable than Keras. Keras is really high level. It's like quite high level. Um, it's like the SD learn over the Exactly, yeah. It's a good, that's a good analogy, yeah. I, I really think Keras is a great, I mean, I mean, look, like Keras is very high level, but the thing is like for 99% of the things that you can do, that it's perfect. It's really great. Now, you, now like a research scientist might not want to use Keras because they need a little bit more customiz customizability, but you're probably at the point that you need that, you already know what you need. <laughs> I would really say use Keras, yeah. So I think it's a really good introduction, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what was the question? Yeah, it basically tends to flow, yeah. Tiana is discontinued. Can you really make something bigger in the and find the world? Oh, um, yeah, sure. I, I, I think, yeah, you should be able to. I'm not exactly sure, but, but I, would, I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Because Keras is basically wrapping TensorFlow. Um, there might be some weird things that you have to do, like to convert a model possibly from the Keras high-level format container to TensorFlow, but, but I'm sure in principle it can be done. Or you could again. I mean, all over the place there's like, there's not any like one place that just collects data sets, or I mean, maybe there's some that I, I don't know of, I mean, really, like, machine learning scientists famously use the same data sets over and over. Um, you know, MNIST and CIFAR, uh, which they probably shouldn't. There, there's, like, things like ImageNet and MS Coco, which are really big resources. Then you can also, like, the, there's a thing, like, the UCI Berkeley repository of data sets. It's just a big data, like, a website that has data sets. 
on it, and otherwise there's like, it's a little bit disorganized, to be quite honest, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think all that stuff is well on its way. Like, uh, I think it's still needs work to be done, but, but like, there's a lot of research being done these days to try to make them more controllable, more interpretable. There's a lot of demand for that, so, so like, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there, uh, I think there's some stuff being done now with Arduino, like really, uh, like, yeah, like trying to, trying to get some basic image classification stuff on Arduino. Of course, Arduino has very low resources, right? So it's like a pretty difficult thing, but I, I'm aware, I'm not super connected to the physical computing world, so I don't really, really know. However, I think in principle, there is some of this kind of stuff going on. And um, also, like, people are using this stuff on Raspberry Pis, and of course, Raspberry Pi, it's like, the whole point of that is you have a small computer that can be embedded in a lot of places, and, yeah, but, but physical stuff, like, I think, for sure, um, I just don't, I'm not super, don't know much about, yeah, about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like like Yeah, so I can imagine, yeah, yeah, like maybe you'll have a lot of architectural assistant tools that'll be able to like, you'll be able to make a schematic and it will complete part of it for you or maybe texture it. Um, maybe like musicians will have, be able to like generate sounds from video clips. And, uh, films? Animation, yeah, animation is, is super... Yeah, exactly, yeah, like the, and people have already started doing this kind of stuff with films, like I've already heard of a few, like even Hollywood, like people experimenting film stuff. I don't think so. Yeah, right, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, this is like the uh, recent year we were spoiled on the Yeah, but that's actually <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Gans is unsupervised, yep. 
but it's supervised by the session model. Right. Technically, it's still considered unsupervised. Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, I mean, it like of course, like it depends on what you're asking about. Some things need more, more than one. Like, like really high, high. Like the then Nvidia progressive growing of GANs thing, like you can't do on one GPU. WaveNet, like hard to do on one GPU. I think some of them are bigger, even like the Voltas. I think I have like more, but. It it yeah it does like so I mean but a lot like a lot of times like uh, deep learning like neural networks are very parallelizable you can parallel parallelize across uh, like even within layers if you want or within batches uh, and that will reduce the memory and so if you like like I think. Uh, I, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but what Google's original WaveNet, they parallelized across like some ridiculous number of GPUs, like 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 30, you know. So it's it's now of course like mere, us mere mortals, we can't do that uh, easily, but uh, but I mean, you know, something. Uh, m most of the things that that are interesting to artists so far, like. You can do in a lot less resources than you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 80 20 rule, right? Like, eight, <laughs> exactly, yeah. 80% of the effectiveness is within the first 20% of the resources consumed, yeah. usually. Yeah. This is like a mosquito competition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'm going to share this.